In just a moment, X minus one. But first, if you're planning to join the family for this holiday weekend, remember you have a friend who will keep you company through the long hours on the road. That friend is your car radio, and it brings you a full weekend of the most stimulating variety entertainment when you tune in to NBC's Monitor. Yes, you set your dial just once for hours and hours of refreshing variety. News as it happens, sports coverage, everything from baseball to skin diving, interviews with the stars, plus lots of the relaxing music you like to hear. It's all on Monitor this weekend. And now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Night Story, A Pail of Air, by Fritz Leiber. It was pretty quiet in the nest. Pa was just sitting by the fire, staring into it like he does these days. And Ma was asleep. That's why it was so quiet. Ma has some pretty bad times when she just screams and screams and huddles back against the blankets that line the nest. Sis was looking at herself in the mirror that hangs next to the bookshelf. I don't know what she finds to look at so long, but then she's a girl. She just looks at herself. Saturdays, when Pa puts a couple of extra lumps of coal on the fire and we take a bath, she looks at herself in the mirror and sometimes she cries. I dropped the book I was reading, and I guess that woke Ma. Huh? Uh, what? Huh? Pick up the book, bud. I'm sorry, Pa. It's come back. Hasn't it, Alfred? It's come back. It was just Bud. He dropped his book. Oh, but it's come back. It... Why, it's out there now, isn't it? I, I feel a lot warmer. Now, Ethel. It... It's up there in the sky. Just the way it always was. I know. I... I had a dream, Alfred. I know, dear. Sis, melt your mother a cup of water. I'm combing my hair. Sis. Oh, all right. I've got to get up. I... I know it's there. There'll be crocuses and the spring bulbs and daffodils. What are daffodils, Ma? Well, buddy, they're... Oh, they're a flower, and they're very pretty. Yellow on a tall green stalk. Oh, I want to go out. I, I want to take the children out. All right now, Ethel. Here's some water. Come on, children. We'll all go out and you can play in the sun. Sure, Ma. Here, drink the water, Ma. It's cold, Alfred. You wrap on the pipes and make that super send up some more heat. What's a super, Pa? It doesn't matter, Bud. There aren't any anymore. Oh. Pa, the pail's running low. Bud, you better get into your things and go out and get an extra pail of air. There are a couple of pails behind the first blankets. Go on, get into your things. <laughs> it isn't back, is it? No, it isn't. There's no sun in the sky. No sun, is there? No, Ma. What was it like? The sun. Sis, don't get your Ma upset. The sun was yellow. And so bright you couldn't look at it. Burning hot. So hot. But when you stretched out in it, it made you feel warm all over. Tingly warm. It's been so long since I've been that warm. I was warm last year on my birthday when Pa put all that extra coal on. And then... Every morning it would come out of the east, make the clouds all pink and yellow. And the mist would rise in the ground and then 
Slowly, everything would glow warmer. Warmer. And then it would be up there in the sky. Shining. Warm. Hurry up, bud. I'm almost ready, Pa. I want the sun. I want the sun there. Alfred, get me the sun. It's gone, Ethel. There's nothing I can do. For Christmas? On my birthday? Go ahead, bud. Take the big pail and get it full this time. There's no sense in taking the trip for only half a bucket of air. Oh, I spilled it the last time. It's dark, Alfred. It's dark. Go ahead, bud. <laughs> Strap down the helmet, will you, sis? For oh, goodness sake, stand up straight. Okay. All right, I'll be right back. Don't hold the blankets open too long. All right, Ethel. We're all safe. Bud will be right back with another pail of air. It's all right. I went through the 30 or so blankets that Pa hung up to slow down the air escaping from the nest. Of course, I knew the way. I've been going out for air since I was a kid. Still, I get a funny, crawly feeling every time I go out of the nest. You've got to go up to the fifth floor, which is just above the blanket of frozen air. You see, when the earth got cold, all the water in the air froze first and made a blanket about ten feet thick or so. And then down on top of that dropped all the crystals of frozen air, making another blanket sixty or seventy feet thick. I came out of the window we use on the fifth floor and started to scoop up the air into my pail. I had it about full. Boy, my fingers are getting pretty cold. But I saw something. Hey! That's a light! Oh, darn it, I kicked over the bucket. Oh, there can't be a light. Not moving around in a window like that. There can't be. Ma and Pa and Sis are back in the nest. I'm up here, and there can't be anyone else. Everybody on Earth is dead except us. I had an idea how Ma must feel sometimes, the way she sees things. But there it was, moving around in the building across the way. I stood there shaking, and I almost froze my feet. I did frost my helmet so solid on the inside I couldn't see anything. So I hurried up and scooped up another bucket of air and headed back for the nest as fast as I could. Pa! Pa, I saw something! Go on, hang those outside clothes up by the fire. Phew! Pa, I saw something, I did! Shh! Mother's quiet now. Don't upset him. Pa, it was a light. Wait till I get this air next to the fire. Uh, give me the cloth, sis. Shall I put another lump of coal on, Pa? No, no, no. The oxygen from this bucket will get the fire up when it begins to melt. There. Pa, I'm trying to tell you. I saw something up there. Light. There's lots of lights. Stars. I know what stars look like, Dopey. They're big, steady white lights in the sky. This was down here in a building. What is it? Alfred, what is it? Nothing, nothing, Ethel. Now, what is this, bud? Well, first I thought it was a lady, a young lady. <laughs> I mean it, like in one of those old magazines. I thought I saw it in a window, but then all I saw was a light. You watched it for some time, son? Long enough for it to pass five windows and go to the next floor. And it didn't look like stray electricity? No, Pa, I know what that looks like. Or a star refracted through an icicle? Sometimes if you catch it at the right angle... It... Pa, honest, I never saw anything like it before. Yeah. All right. I'll go out with you and you show me. No, no, Alfred. You can't go and leave us alone, not both of you. It's all right. We'll be right back. Here's your helmet, Pa. There, there's something out there. I've always known there was something out there waiting to get us. <clears throat> Hand me my glove. Something that's part of the cold. Hates all warmth. Wants to destroy the nest. It's been watching us all this time. Now, now it's coming after us. And it'll get you. And then it'll come for me. Oh, don't go. Alfred, please don't go. Everything will be all right. Now, sis. Yes, Pa? You come watch the fire. Keep an eye on that air, too. If it gets too low or doesn't seem to be boiling fast enough, get another bucket behind the blanket. Alfred, don't go. I'll take care of it, Pa. Could there really be anybody out there? I don't see how. 
We heard the last radio voices a year before Bud was born. There hasn't been anything since then. Then what could it be? I don't know. Probably just a reflection. An ice crystal cracking. Come on, Bud. Get your helmet on. It's funny. When I go out alone, I'm not scared or anything. But when I go out with Pa, I always hang on to his belt like I used to when I was a little kid. Habit, I guess. It's the same no matter what trip we take. On the fifth floor, we stopped to rest just before we went out. We were in the room with the frozen people. The lady sitting looking at the door. The man holding his hands over that funny metal thing Pa calls a radiator. It was like a fire, I guess, but I don't see any place for the cold. We put our helmets together so we could talk. Catch your breath, son. Pa, would it be possible... I mean, for any of the frozen people to come to life? Like the ones down in the basement around the furnace when we go for water? No, they're dead. They were caught too quickly when it happened. Oh, Pa, how do we know we're the only ones? We don't, but... Well, there's a feeling you get. Because it's always night. There used to be some of that feeling every night in the old days. But the sun chased it away every morning. You wouldn't know about that. You weren't born when the dark star pulled us away from the sun. You wouldn't know unless you'd seen the sun. I've seen the sun. It's that big star at the end of the Big Dipper. I've seen it. It isn't the same. Come on. We're wasting time. I don't know what the city looked like in the old days, but now it's beautiful. The starlight lets you see it pretty well. We're up on a hill, and the plain slopes down away from us. Some taller buildings push up out of the feathery plain, topped by rounded caps of air crystals. Some of them are on a slant because a lot of the buildings are badly twisted by the quakes and everything when a dark star pulled the earth away from the sun. That's why Pa can't seal up the nest airtight. The building's twisted too bad. Besides, we have to keep the chimney open. We touched our helmets together so we could talk. Is that where you saw it, son? It, it isn't there anymore. Uh-huh. But it feels different. I mean, as if there's something out here waiting. Bud, if you see something like that again, don't tell the others. Huh? Why not? Well, the Ma's sort of nervous these days, and we owe her all the feeling of safety we can give her. Once it was when your sister was born, I was ready to give up and die, but your mother kept me trying. Another time, she kept the fire going a whole week all by herself when I was sick. She couldn't do that now. Not the way she is. But you know that game we sometimes play, tossing a ball around? Well, courage is like a ball. A person can hold it only so long, and then he's got to toss it to someone else. When it's tossed your way, you've got to catch it and hold it tight. And hope there'll be someone else to toss it to when you get tired of being brave. Yeah, I guess so. Come on. We'll fill up the pails and get back. But what about whatever it is out here? We'll just have to wait and see. Come on. Before the helmets frost over. It's pretty hard to hide your feelings in the nest. I mean, there's just room for the four of us. The blanket overhead just touches when Pa stands up straight. The floor is all covered with thick, woolly rugs. Pa says it's inside a much bigger room, but I've never seen the real walls or ceiling. Well, anyway, Pa laughed and kidded about what I'd seen. He said I had an imagination, but we could tell he took it serious. It was Sunday morning by the clocks that Pa kept all wound up on the shelf. So it was time for the story. We all sat around in a circle the way we always do. Except I noticed that Pa casually took a hammer from the shelf and put it beside him. I always liked the story. Of course, Sis and I know it by heart for now. I mean, every Sunday since we were kids. But every once in a while, Pa surprises us by telling it a little different. 
or throwing in some extras. It starts out with a song. Ma used to sing it, but she forgets the words sometimes. And now Pa sings it mostly. Oh, beautiful for spacious skies, for amber waves of grain, thy purple mountain majesties above the fruited plain. Of course, the words don't mean anything. I mean, the skies are spacious enough, but there aren't any waves of grain. And the plane is all covered with a blanket of frozen air. But it's part of the story ceremony, and Pa likes it. He says it reminds him of the old days. After the song, Pa starts the story. In the days of my youth, the sun hung above, golden and warm. And the earth was fruitful and multiplied, and the fields were green, and the day was glorious. And the wind blew across the hilltops, and the air was free and good to breathe. That's the part of the story I like best, about how it was with the sun nice and warm. It's hard to believe all those people living without having to worry about cold and air. They were waking up sweating and screaming because you dreamed the fire went out. It's impossible to believe, but... Pa was a good storyteller, and he made it seem real. And then the dark star came rushing out of space. In the beginning, they tried to keep the news from the people, but when the floods and the earthquakes started, the truth came out. At first, they thought the dark star would hit the sun, and then they were afraid it would strike the earth itself. But it didn't. It only came close. <laughs> Pa tells it like the sun and the dark star fought for the earth like two dogs over a bone. I know what he means, because I've seen a picture of a dog in a magazine. And then the dark star won and carried us off. But the sun kept the moon. There were earthquakes and floods. Pa says that mountains fell and oceans slopped over. Oceans, that's, that's a lot of melted water lying around loose. It's hard to imagine. And Pa says it was so. Then came the open question time in the story. Sis asked a question about what girls wore for clothes. And I asked Pa how people acted in those days when the earth was twisted and jerked almost apart. Well, bud, I was too busy to notice much. A friend of mine, Dr. Weisbrot, and Kelly, the geophysicist, and Walters, the astronomer, we knew what was going to happen. And we were working to fix up a place with airtight walls and insulation and big supplies of food and bottled air. But the place got smashed up in the earthquakes and... They were all killed. So I put the nest together at the last minute in the living room of our apartment. It's a four-room apartment. You must have seen some of the people, like the frozen ones downstairs. At that time, Bud, I only thought of one thing. Your mother and survival. If I had stopped to think, I wouldn't have even tried to make the nest. It would have seemed ridiculous. Blankets and a coal fire against the cold and vacuum of space. But I didn't think. I survived. I wasn't listening carefully as Pa went on about the building of the nest. I kept thinking about something else. About that light I'd seen outside. I kept asking myself, what if the frozen people were coming to life? What if they were like the liquid helium that crawls toward heat when it should be frozen solid? What if something were coming from the dark star to get us? Something... Making the frozen people move, not by themselves. That would fit with what I'd seen. A young lady's face and the moving light. I sat there and shivered, thinking of the frozen people with minds from the dark star creeping, crawling, snuffing their way, following the heat to the nest. And then, over from beyond the blankets, I thought I heard a tiny noise. So I asked myself then, What's the use of going on? Why prolong a doomed existence of hard work and cold and loneliness? The human race is done. The earth is done. 
Why not give up, I asked myself. And then I did hear the noise, louder this time, a kind of shuffling tread coming closer. And then I got the answer. The Earth's always been a lonely place millions of miles from the next planet. And no matter how long the human race might have lived, the end would have come some night. Those things don't matter. What matters is that life is good. There's a lovely texture, like some rich cloth or fur, or the petals of flowers, crocuses, daffodils, or the fire's glow. And that's as true for the last man as the first. Still, those steps kept shuffling closer. Pa was talking, and Ma was dreaming with her eyes closed, and Sis was looking at herself sideways in the mirror. And I was the only one who heard the noise. The noise outside. So right then and there I told myself that I was going on as if we had all eternity ahead of us. I'd have children, and I'd teach them all I could. I'd get them to read books, try to enlarge and seal the nest. I'd try to keep everything beautiful and alive. I'd keep alive my feeling of wonder, even at the cold and the dark. And the distant stars. Pa. Shh. Pa, I-, I hear. I know. What is it, Alfred? What is it? What's going on? Oh, you've got to tell me. Pa, I'm scared. Quiet. But you heard it? Uh-huh. A kind of shuffling coming toward the nest. Oh. Sis, take care of your mother. It's all right, Ma. Lie down. I'll take the hammer. You take the hatchet. What is it, Pa? What is it? I don't know. Listen. It's closer. Oh, mush. Pa, the blanket is moving. Ready with your axe. Hello. Ah! Who's there? Is there somebody in there? Come in. It's all right. They're alive. Alive. Who are you? Alfred. Alfred. Hutchinson. Dr. Alfred Hutchinson. You can take off your helmets in here. But the air. We have air. We bring it in in pails. Come on, Ralph. Let's take off the helmets. It's it's impossible. Where are you from? We thought we were the only ones. Los Alamos. The nuclear laboratory. Yes, that's right. We get our power from the reactor, using the stockpile of bombs for fuel. Then, there are others. There are. There are other men. (laughs) There are other men. Pa, Pa, is it all right? Should I put the axe down? Yes, yes, it's all right. You can put it down. Come from another nest? It's a little bigger than this. We've got a small airtight city with airlocks. We generate our electricity, food from hydroponics. I can't believe it. I can't. I can't believe this. It's impossible. You can't maintain an air supply without hermetic sealing. It's impossible. Oh, no, no, it's simple. As long as you keep the fire going to melt the air and enough air boiling to keep the fire burning. How did you come here? Why? Well, we keep scouting around for survivors. There are a number of colonies, Brookhaven, Oak Ridge, and Harwell in England, and the Argonne Laboratory in France. We didn't expect to find anything in this city, though. But our detectors picked up a heat tray, so we tracked it down. Alfred, you're forgetting your manners. We have company. Of course, of course. Sis, throw a handful of coal on the fire. Pa, a whole handful? Doesn't matter now. And Bud... Bring out another pail of air. Oh, it's incredible. And you have laboratories and transport? We only have a two-seater scout, but if we rip out the bulkhead to the storage compartment, we can make it all right. We can have you back at Los Alamos in four hours. Oh, what's the matter? I guess we really hadn't thought about it that way. But uh, I, I wouldn't know how to act there. And besides, I haven't any clothes. Just doesn't seem right to let this fire go out. It's been 18 years. Burning every minute. 
But you can't stay here. Ralph. But after all... Ralph. Oh. Uh, look, Dr. Hutchinson, we'll go out to the ship and bring back a small power heater. I know this is very sudden and upsetting to you. You need a chance to adjust. We'll be back in a few minutes. It's incredible. In buckets. Air in buckets. Well. They didn't think the nest smelled so good. I could tell. She, she had a wave in her hair. Did you see that? And, and lipstick. I suppose we have to decide what to do. Pa, at Los, Los Alamos and those other places, there'll be lots of people, won't there? Yes. I mean, not just your father or a brother. That's right. Boys? I suppose so. But somehow I feel a little empty. Alfred. Alfred, it's different now that we know others are alive. You don't have to feel the responsibility for keeping the human race going. Paul, I, I'd like to see those rockets and laboratories. Wouldn't you, Paul? I suppose so. It won't be easy leaving the nest. I mean, it, it's just right and there's only four of us. It, it's kind of a scary idea. Big place with a lot of strangers. You'll get over that feeling, son. The trouble with the world was that it kept getting smaller and smaller till it ended with just the nest. Now it'll be good to have a real huge world again. The way it was in the beginning. And so we're going to leave the nest in the morning. By pause clocks. We've got the power heater going now. <laughs> Seems funny to be this warm when it isn't Christmas or somebody's birthday. But still, it's hard for me to realize that this is the last time I'll go out of the nest. Through all the blankets. To get a pail of air. <laughs> You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was an NBC Radio Network production. In just a moment, X-1. But first, how does one man get himself into so many impossible situations? This is a question you'll probably ask yourself tomorrow night when you follow another hilarious adventure of Throckmorton P. Gildersleeve. Yes, Gildy's eye for the ladies and his impulsive temperament managed to entangle him in a web of riotous circumstances. Join the romantic water commissioner, his neighbors, Judge Hooker, Mr. Peavy, and all the loyal Gildersleeve household as they romp through another episode of The Great Gildersleeve, tomorrow night. And now stay tuned for X-1 on NBC. <laughs> Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight's story, The Cave of Night, 
by James E. Gunn. Oh, you want a level, Charlie? Okay. Uh, though yet of Hamlet our dear brothers, death the memory be... Na- uh, anyway, how's it, okay? Okay. okay. Uh, check recording. Will I, I may go over a half hour. M- make sure they've got another reel of tape ready. Okay? All right. Uh, look, Bill, I've just put the segments of tape together for the next week's show. I'm going to record my narrations, and we'll listen to it together tomorrow. I know this is unusual, but you're the producer, and I don't want you out on a limb that may be sawed off behind us. This week's show is uh, liable to either win us every award from the Peabody to the Pulitzer Prize, or maybe put the network out of business. Okay, we, uh, we start with a standard opening. Behind the world, etc., you know, 40 seconds. <clears throat> this is Harry Anders, your editor. At 8 o'clock, after the sun has set and the sky is darkening, look up. There's a man up there where no man has ever been. He is lost in the cave of night. And the fuel tank's empty. Receiver broken. Transmitting and clear. Anyone picking this up, anyone. This is Rev McMillan calling. Notify Goddard Rock, New Mexico. No way to get back. There's a man up there where no man has ever been. He is lost in the cave of night. We all know that phrase now, the cave of night. It was written by a poet disguised in the cynical hide of a newspaper rewrite man. But it stuck. It caught the world and held it like a butterfly pinned to a board. It started with a ham, an amateur radio operator, in Davenport, Iowa. Uh, all right, Eddie. Roll the first tape in here. Now, it's marked. Am I too close? I was up in the attic. I usually have a talk with WG-73. He's in Buenos Aires. We play chess. Well, uh, there was some kind of interference. And then all of a sudden, I heard this voice. Uh, I record most of my listening anyway, so I had the tape machine running. After I heard it, I called civil defense. Uh, That's what we're supposed to. Uh, Look, Bill... I haven't done the final editing on these tapes, so don't worry if they're a little rough. Down out of the night, flung from the darkness, came these words, the first of so many that electrified the world. Notify Goddard Rock, New Mexico. No way to get back. No way to get back. I'm stuck up here. No way to get down. What does it take to catch the pity of the world? A man wedged underground in Kentucky. A little girl in the bottom of a well. Somebody alive, waiting for rescue, with the days of his life numbered. Somebody somewhere waiting for us to get him out. The story broke in this morning's papers. Orbiting 1,000 miles above our heads was a man, an officer of the United States Air Force in a fuelless spaceship. We're recording at the desk of Mike Bayless, senior night editor of the Continental Press National Wire. <clears throat> they always get a reaction like this. I remember the Floyd Collins story in the 20s. Fellow trapped in that cave in Kentucky, remember? Oh, sure. And the whole country hanging on to see if we could get out. Then there was that uh, little girl stuck in the well. Kathy Fiskus? Yeah. yeah. We pulled all those stories out and put them on the wire for background. But this hit bigger. We got the first lead from an Air Force handout in New Mexico. They just said an experimental rocket failed to return to base. But by that time, the cat was out of the bag. Ham operators picked up those messages from Boston to Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, Mr. Bayless, you first used the phrase, the cave of night, didn't you? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I mean, you know, you got to get a little purple on a thing like this. People eat it up. You can't spread it on too thick. Anyway... I was lost in a cave once when I was a kid in upstate New York. I waited around for a couple of hours in the dark until they came for me. It uh, kind of reminded me of that. It reminded the world of terrors at night, of struggling awake through nightmares. The fears of loneliness, darkness, falling, suffocation, thirst. It reminded me of Rev McMillan. Perhaps I have an advantage over all the other reporters for newspapers and radio and television because I knew Rev McMillan. I knew him in college and in the Air Force. 
I knew that he was testing rocket-powered craft at Goddard, but I didn't know they were so close to space. No one knew. Till those messages of desperation crackled down through the atmosphere. I remembered Rev when I saw those headlines that morning. Straight black hair, Clark Gable ears, a reckless grin. He ate well, reveled in expert jazz and Mozart opera, and he talked incessantly. His southern speech was no draw. There was too much to say. And now he was alone. And soon all that might be extinguished. The men from the radio newsrooms rushed to Goddard Rocket Base armed with miniature tape recorders. I was a good story on this. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I'll hold it down for I'm, uh, I'm <clears throat> Colonel Arthur J. Hannigan, information officer for Goddard Rocket Base. And I'm authorized to issue the following statement. First Lieutenant Reverty L. McMillan, United States Air Force pilot, Experimental Rocket Division took off from Goddard Base at 2234 Rocky Mountain Time. As craft, the XR-37 Mark II, a hydrazine nitric three-stage rocket. I'm sorry I can't describe it, boys, classified. Well, in order to maintain orbit, the motors were pulsed for one second every 15 seconds elapsed time. After three minutes, the exhaust was seen by ground spectroscope observation to flare for half a minute. As fuel supply is exhausted, the craft has reached sustaining orbital speed. Well, what does that mean, Colonel? He's out of gas. He can't get down. The first mobilization was of the scientific brains massed at Goddard. Few of them knew Rev. Brains at a research project are usually carefully sorted out and salted away from the distractions of the outside world. They designed, they invented, they calibrated and theorized. But they didn't know the short, stocky man with a lopsided grin who rode the fruit of their labor up and out and now circled the world of his birth with time ticking out. I covered the hearings in Washington for the network newsroom. I flew down from New York and the stewardess came out every few minutes to tell the passengers the latest news. She called him Rev, although she never knew him, and once I thought I saw a tear. The hearing was before the subcommittee of the Senate Committee on Military Affairs, presiding Senator Alan J. Hagister of Kentucky. <coughs> All right, General Finch. You've made the technical situation fairly comprehensive, even to an old cane break, redneck hillbilly like myself. <laughs> I have tried to make the gravity of the situation apparent, sir. It appears to me, General, that the sacred life of a human being created in the image of his maker is in danger. It is no light thing to be thrown away like some guinea pig. If that ship wasn't safe, if that poor man up there in the cave of night is to die, Somebody is responsible. Isn't that right, General? Sir, a manned rocket was sent up because of one simple fact. It takes a computer of tremendous versatility and capacity to operate a Harrison Munch reactor engine. A computer of infinite complexity. And I ask you, General, I put the question to you, why was such a computer not designed? It has been designed, sir. It was designed a half a million years ago. There is only one mechanism competent to handle those controls, sir. That is the human brain. <clears throat> All right. I turn now to my second question, General, and I ask it not only for myself and my colleagues on this committee, but for 170 million Americans listening on the radio, watching on television. With that man up there living out his last days, why was it not possible to send a ship up after him? Why was there no second ship built? For one reason, Senator, money. The appropriation for rocket research fell short by 12% of the amount needed even to build one vessel. Oh, frankly, gentlemen, the deficiency was made up by cutting corners and diverting funds from other projects. That is not the point, General. There's a man up there who's going to die. With the limited funds you gave us, we've done what we set out to do. We've demonstrated that space flight is possible, that a space platform is feasible. If there is any inefficiency, if there is any blame for what has happened, it lies at the door of those who lack the confidence and the courage and ability of their countrymen to 
fight free of earth to their greatest glory. Senator, how did you vote on that? <laughs> <laughs> This is Harry Anders in the gallery of the Washington National Cathedral. This is a special prayer service called by the Dean of the Cathedral for the safety of Lieutenant McMillan and for the success of the recently announced rescue plan. The church is filled. There's a sprinkling of high Navy, Army, and Air Force uniforms. I see General Finch in the second row, next to the Secretary of the Air Force and the newly appointed Under Secretary of Defense, Mr. Winokur. Prominently displayed in the center aisle, below the ornate railing separating the pews from the altar, is the small model of Macmillan's ship. One by one now, the congregation is filing past, dropping checks, bills. I saw one child drop in 12 pennies, one by one. All contributions are to be used to defray the cost of the rescue effort. The congregation is now kneeling to pray. A moment of silent prayer will follow for the safety and rescue of Lieutenant McMillan. One billion dollars was raised in one week from voluntary contributions. Another billion and a half was appropriated unanimously by Congress. The race began. Would the rescue party reach the ship in time? Of course, we didn't know then. And daily we listened to the voice of the man we hoped to buy back from death. Uh, now, look, Bill. On these McMillan broadcast tapes, a... Uh, don't let some, some ignorant engineering vice president holler because it's not broadcast quality. Believe me, I knew Macmillan. There's more of that wild Texan in these tapes than in any, any hi-fi super frequency response studio recordings. Just listen. You, you'll see what I mean. I've been staring out the portholes. I never tire of it. Through the window at the right, I see a black velvet curtain with a strong light behind it. There are pinpoint holes in the the light shines through, not winking the way stars do, but steady. There's no air up here, that's the reason. My oxygen is holding out better than I expected. By my figures, it should last 27 days more. I shouldn't use so much of it talking all the time, but it's hard to stop. Talking, I feel as if I was still in touch with the earth. Still one of you. Even though I am way up here. Too bad the receiver is broken, but if it had to be one or the other, I'm glad it was the transmitter that came through all right. There's only one of me. There are billions of you to talk to. You can't see me now. You'll have to wait hours for the dawn. I'll have mine in a few minutes. That's the way he talked. And as we listened to the lonely voice from the night, the engineers, the scientists, the construction men worked round the clock. General Finch presented the problem in the pool interview. I asked the questions for the combined networks that afternoon. Most of you heard the complete broadcast live as he briefed the world with the clipped laconic delivery of a soldier. There are two basic problems. We've recovered the first and second stages of the rocket. We've only to construct the third stage. The second problem is more difficult. The pilot. Lieutenant McMillan was the only man physically and psychologically qualified. We discovered that in our first program. His training and orientation took 18 months. We have now to duplicate this in 27 days. You think it's possible, General? I don't know. Uh, that's all, Mr. Anders. Uh, Stevenson, get me some coffee, will you? Black and some kind of sandwich, no butter, no mayonnaise. And then the voice from the cave asked a question and expected no answer. Do you hear me down there? Sometimes I wonder. I wish there was some way I could be sure you were hearing me. Just that one thing might keep me from going crazy. I was there the night we answered that question. I was there in a helicopter over Kansas City. This is Harry Anders speaking to you from a helicopter over Kansas City. There are 15 seconds till midnight. The plan was developed by General Finch. At precisely midnight, every light in the city will be out and then flashed on in two-second intervals. 
This will be the exact moment that Macmillan's ship is calculated to pass overhead. It's, it's almost time now. Five, four, three, two, one. There they go. Off. On. Off. On. Off. On. I see it. I see it. Kansas City winking at me. Oh, yes, I can see it. Thanks. Thanks. You're listening. I know that now. I'm not alone. I'll never forget. I'm waiting for you. We're recording in the press gallery of the Goddard Rocket Base Main Construction Hangar. The vast third stage component stands before us, men swarming up and down the gantry cranes. The Mark III is being built to carry five men instead of one. The pilot selection has been kept a top secret to avoid unnecessary strain on the men selected. The latest progress report gives a possible margin of six hours between the launching of the rescue ship and the estimated exhaustion supply of oxygen to Lieutenant McMillan. Oh, the shift is changing now. The expert construction workers recruited from across the country by the combined efforts of the Air Force Personnel Service, the Atomic Energy Commission, and the International United Electrical Workers and United Auto Workers of the AFL-CIO. The margin is six hours. Six hours between life and death for Lieutenant Reverdy L. McMillan. saw the sun rise over Russia. It looks like any other land from here. The green where it should be green. Farther north, a, a sort of mud color. And then white where the snow is still deep. Up here, you wonder why we're so different when the land is the same. You think we're all the same children of the same mother planet. Who says we're different? Uh, can you hear me in the back? Yes, a little close. Well, uh, how about this? Yeah, that's better. That's better. All right, gentlemen, I have exactly five minutes for the press conference, therefore I'm not going to answer any questions. Progress report is as follows. As a safety factor, we're constructing two complete three-stage rockets and six additional third-stage components. The telemetered reports from Macmillan's ship have added important additional information and the first of the rescue vessels should be ready to be launched at the estimated time, weather permitting. Now, don't ask a question. Within certain limitations of air turbulence, the rocket will be ready to lift in time to save Lieutenant McMillan. 21 days. The air is bad tonight. I can't seem to get a full breath. It seems to stick in the lungs. It doesn't matter, though. But I wish you could see what I've seen. Vast spreading universe around Earth like a bride in a soft veil. You'd know then that we belong out here. Come out, mankind. Come out and see what I have seen. This is Harry Anders at Goddard Rocket Base. The Harrison Munch reactor engine for the first third stage rescue is being tested here at Goddard. You can hear the roaring of the gases in the test chamber behind me. The work has been stepped up as a new calculation based on the increased temperature reading from Macmillan's ship indicates that the exhaustion time will be some six hours earlier than originally estimated. The margin of rescue will be in minutes. Air very bad. Better hurry. Can't last much longer. It's silly, of course you'll hurry. But I don't want anyone feeling sorry for me. I've seen the stars clearly. But more than this, I've seen the earth. There where I have lived and loved. I have known it better than any man. And loved it better. And known its children better. Goodbye. I have a better tomb than the greatest conqueror Earth ever bore. Do not disturb. No. 
Count down for blast off. Five, four, three, two, one. Anders, tape 323. We're in the press operation room of Goddard Field. The rescue rocket has been aloft 53 minutes plus. Its calculated time of arrival is 54 minutes. You will hear the voice of General Beauregard Finch on a direct pickup from the rescue vessel, which has been named unofficially the Lifesaver. Silent crowds have collected at the outer perimeter of the rocket base, as if by their presence they might help it... Come, quiet, quiet. The next voice you hear will be General Finch aloft in the rescue ship. The voice quality may not be good. He's speaking over a throat mic in his pressure suit. Mark three to base. This is Finch. We'll secure the cable. We have just secured to the airlock of Macmillan's ship. I'm now entering the lock. The inner door is closed. I have closed the outer door. The inner door is cycling. Now it is open. Bring in those oxy bottles, will you? The bulkhead to the control room is open. Is he all right? Come on, will you? What's happening? Lieutenant McMillan is dead. He died heroically, waiting till all hope was gone until every oxygen gauge stood at zero. And then, well, the airlock was open when we arrived. In accordance with his own wish, his body will be left here in its eternal orbit. I'm going to leave now. My feet will be the last to touch this deck. Lieutenant McMillan is in his control chair, staring out towards the stars. I'll leave the airlock doors open behind me. Let the airless, frigid arms of space protect and preserve for all eternity. This man they would not let go. Well, that's the show, Bill. Bill, you remember at the conference we we hadn't made up our mind whether to pick anything up from the celebration last night after the news of the Mars landing? I said it was the right end for Rev. McMillan's story. You said it was old stuff. Every kid knew the sequence. The ships built to rescue Rev used to set up the satellite base from the base to the moon and now to Mars. Well, I went out with a mini-tape last night and I've got the end of the story. Here it is. This is Harry Anders in Times Square. The neon rocket ship at the top of the Times building has just flashed into brilliant light. The signal that the landing signal has been received from the rocket Rev McMillan III. Man has landed on Mars. And a holiday crowd here in Times Square is celebrating like a thousand New Year's rolled into one. I'm being, I'm being tossed and pushed and clapped on the back all at once. Uh, let's see what the man in the street thinks about man on Mars. Uh, you, uh, you, sir, uh, I'm broadcasting. No, no. No, no. How do you feel about it, sir? How do you feel tonight about man's conquest of space, of the planet? Leave me alone. I'm in a hurry. Uh, just a few words of the... Look, you get your hands off me. Let go of me. I'm not in... Wait, wait a minute, sir. Wait, wait. A... Wait. Rev! Rev, come back here. Rev! You think I could listen to that voice over and over in a tape editing room and not know every vowel, every consonant? I'm telling you, Bill, I saw him. Rev McMillan. The black hair was gray and those Clark Able ears were pinned back, but that's a simple operation. I played that piece of tape over and over. It was Rev. I know it. He isn't up there. He's alive. We've got it, Bill. We've got it on our show. We'll break it. Rev McMillan is alive. I haven't written it yet, but we finish it off with this, with a question. Why did they announce he was dead? I'm in the tape editing room now. I've got the reel ready to record the answer. Excuse me, Mr. Andrews. I'm... Uh, Hey, hey, hey. Just a minute. I'm recording. You better see the page outside of the... Mr. Andrews, I'd like to talk to you for a moment, if I may. I have a letter of authorization. Oh, uh, oh, just a minute. I'll, I'll be through in a minute. Look, Bill, I've got the answer now. Last night, they landed on Mars. But that first ship, the one that circles up there now, there isn't anybody on it. There never was, except a 30 days recording and a transmitter. That's all. He was never up there. 
They didn't have the money for a manned rocket. They wanted a crash program all out, so they sent a decoy up. <laughs> and we all broke our hearts to rescue the man who wasn't there. Oh, he must be laughing, General Finch and the rest of them, the ones that knew. You know, I guess they had a problem. What to do with Rev? I wonder if he slipped away from whatever guards they have around him to see the celebration. He looked a little, uh, a little sad. I think sometimes he must wish he was really up there in the cave of night, seated in the icy control room, 1,075 miles above the earth, staring out at the stars. Mr. Anders, I must insist... What? That... Uh, oh, uh... Oh, Bill. Looks as if I won't have to worry about editing this tape. My friends are from Washington. I'd like to call your attention to the last paragraph. What? Oh, no, 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 no. It's very simple. You won't have to burn it. It's easy to destroy a recording tape. I throw this switch. When the tape goes through, the erasing head, it's, it's gone forever. Oh, too bad. Would have made one fine show. Okay. So long, Rev. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, 